Welcome to the History Channel's Look Back at the 9-11 Year. I'm Arthur Kent. The terrorist attacks that day focused America's attention on the Islamic world. Some Americans' first reaction was to regard all Muslims as enemies. But it was clear to most that they had to make a distinction between one of the world's great religions and the fanatics who had taken it to a violent extreme. In this program, we'll take a close look at the history and beliefs of Islam, its former empires, and how it has evolved to become the religion it is today. Join us now as the History Channel presents Inside Islam. It is a sound heard around the world five times a day. A simple verse in Arabic, summoning the faithful to prayer, calling them to Islam. The word Islam means submission. Submission is considered the straight path to God. What this means is that our will, all human beings' wills, is subjugated to the will of God. That is what submission means. Accordingly, a Muslim is one who submits to God. Everything revolves around God. Everything we have, all of our thoughts, ideas, uh, our soul, our body, revolves around God. God is the center of life. The Arabic words Islam and Muslim share as their source a more ancient word common to Hebrew and other related languages. The word that we greet each other with is uh, in Hebrew, Shalom Aleichem, which means peace unto you. In Arabic, it's exactly the same, Assalamu Alaikum. And I think that's very important because Islam itself, the very name Islam, comes from a root which means peace. But many in the West today would never associate peace with Islam. To them, Islam appears to be a hostile religion that gives sanction to violence and terrorism. After September 11, it's very difficult to talk of Islam as a religion of peace and compassion. When you visualize those planes flying into the towers, it's very difficult to explain. But recent events are not entirely to blame for this perception. It is rooted in 1,400 years of history. Really take a step back and look at the, the major world religions, the ones that have stood the test of time. Islam is the only tradition that has really ever threatened the existence of Christianity. Since its beginnings in the seventh century, Islam has spread to every corner of the globe. Although Westerners tend to think of it as a religion of the Middle East, most of its adherents live half a world away. Indonesia in Southeast Asia is the largest Islamic country with more than 170 million Muslim citizens. By contrast, only about 7 million Muslims live and practice their religion in the United States. But that number is growing. There are over a thousand mosques in the United States now, and so uh, Islam is not just a world religion that's out there somewhere, but it's very much a, a real presence here in the United States as well. Like most major religions, Islam is composed of different sects or orders that have evolved over the centuries from the original Orthodox tradition. The two largest are Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. The Sunni make up 85% of the world's Muslim population. While the Shia represent about 10%. There are many smaller sects, as well as methods of practice. The mystical Sufis seek a state of purification, allowing them to focus solely on God. 
One Sufi order, the dervishes, spin to attain a state of ecstasy they say brings them closer to God. Though Islam may seem very different, it actually shares a majority of beliefs with the world's other two great monotheistic faiths, Judaism and Christianity. Most important is a common faith in the same God. The word uh, the God in Arabic is Allah. So uh, any person who speaks Arabic, whether Jew or Christian or Muslim, will say Allah for God. Islam itself regards all three religions as part of a single tradition. Judaism came first, Christianity came, and then Islam came. And then it's just a continuation and a um, completion of the same message that God has been trying to send to all people throughout time. The Quran, the holy text of Islam, specifically refers to Jews and Christians as fellow people of the book, that book being the Holy Bible. The Quran retells and expands upon many of the stories of the Bible, going back to the creation. The truth that unites us together at the first level is that we all come from the same family, Adam and Eve. Islam also acknowledges as divinely inspired all the Old Testament prophets, including Noah, Moses, Joseph, Jacob, and even David. Americans, most of the time, do not realize how close Islam is in its fundamental concepts to Christianity and Judaism. Most Americans don't realize, for example, that Muslims consider Jesus to be one of the divinely inspired prophets. Jesus is very, very highly venerated in the Quran. He's mentioned by name 93 times in the Quran, but not as divine. And this is a place where, of course, Christians and Muslims clearly separate. It's a very major issue. As Muslims, we don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We do believe that he was born of a virgin and of Mary. Um, however, we don't believe that he himself is God or that he's a son of God. The story of Jesus in the Quran expands upon his life, adding detail where the Christian Gospels are mute, such as his defense of his mother Mary before the townspeople of Nazareth. The moment they started suspecting about the Virgin Mary, Allah says to Mary, you don't speak to them. You point to your son and let this small baby speak and defend you and defend the integrity and the chastity of his mother. And that's what he did. This miracle is not mentioned in the Bible. The Quran also differs radically from Christian belief in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was so special that when his enemies came to crucify him, God lifted Jesus to heaven, and so Jesus was never crucified. Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. It is in the Chronicle of Abraham in the book of Genesis that we find the roots of Islam in the Bible. Abraham is a highly revered figure in Islam. At every prayer, a Muslim prays for Abraham and his descendants. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all claim uh, a common uh, patriarch in the figure of Abraham, this, uh, this figure who is depicted in the book of Genesis as a kind of uh, monotheist who breaks away, who is called by God and moves towards the promised land. According to the Bible, God told Abraham that he would make his covenant with Abraham's son, Isaac, born of his wife, Sarah. Isaac would become the father of the Hebrew tribes of Israel. But Abraham had another son, his firstborn. In the biblical story, Abraham first has a son via the, the handmaiden of Sarah, uh, Hagar, and the son Ishmael. Sarah is jealous and doesn't like this, and uh, they're ultimately cast out. Sent away by Abraham, Hagar took Ishmael into the wilderness. When their water ran out, the Bible says she abandoned the child to avoid seeing him die of thirst. 
But God heard the cries of the child and caused a spring to bubble forth so that they could drink. God then told Hagar not to fear for her son Ishmael. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him fast, for I will make him a great nation. The Arabs understand that Ishmael is the legitimate son of Abraham. Uh, and so they trace their lineage back to him through Ismail, uh, whereas the Jewish people and the Christian tradition focus on the continuing lineage of the family of Abraham through Isaac as the heir of the promise. Muslims believe Ishmael helped Abraham build a temple at the site of the sacred well, a simple stone edifice called the Kaaba. Abraham then prayed to make it a place of pilgrimage for everyone who believed in the one all-powerful God. A great city grew around the Kaaba, a city known as Mecca. The Temple of Abraham became a sacred stop in the desert for travelers and merchants. Many of the Arab tribes in Mecca prospered from the trade that passed through their city. These tribes formed the foundation of Arabian society. The tribe was the place where an ancient Arabian felt uh, at ease. He, he felt that this was where his identity lay. He felt that this was where his glory and history resided. One such tribe, the Quraysh, enriched themselves by providing food and water to the many pilgrims who came to worship at the Kaaba. Over the centuries, however, the Arabic tribes forgot the faith of Abraham and his one God and the Quraysh became the gatekeepers to a temple for idol worshippers. In the year 570 AD, however, a child would be born to the Quraysh who would cleanse that temple. Like Jesus and the Old Testament prophets before him, he would sweep away the idols, preaching a return to the faith in one God. His name is spoken a million times a day on the streets of every big city in the world. Often accompanied by the blessing, may peace be upon him. Who was this enigmatic man they call the prophet of Islam? Muhammad is nothing but a man, a mortal man, meaning that he's not a divine man. No one knows what he looked like. Representations of him were forbidden by the prophet himself for fear it might lead to worship of his image. In contrast, in Christianity, there are many representations of Jesus in statues, pictures, drawings. Uh, it's hard to enter any Christian church and not see a picture of Jesus. Tradition holds that like Jesus before him, Muhammad was born under the sign of a brilliant star. Legend has it the child's umbilical cord was mysteriously cut without human help. About his early life, we don't know much because as Islamic history developed, Muhammad's life began to be shrouded in legends. What is known is that Muhammad's father died before his birth, leaving the boy unprotected and vulnerable in a strongly patriarchal society. His mother, Amina, took him to live in the house of his grandfather, Abdul Mutalib, an elder in the clan of the Quraysh. According to the custom of his clan, the young Muhammad was soon sent away on a journey meant to prepare an Arab child for a difficult life. He is said to have uh, spent his early days, probably until the age of five or six, uh, with a Bedouin tribe in the desert. Once while he played with the Bedouin children in the wilderness, Muhammad was said to have been beset by a heavenly host. Two angels descended to earth and opened up the boy's heart, removing from it a black spot. Uh, the idea is, of course, to suggest that this was a, a boy from whom sin had been removed. As he grew, Muhammad began traveling with his uncle to learn the profession of the caravan, a business vital to the Meccan tribes. Eventually, by the age of 20 or so, he joined the 
commercial activity of the city and became uh, a caravaneer or acting as an agent for various Meccan merchants. Known as Al Amin, the trustworthy, Muhammad was frequently asked to lead the caravans of other merchants, including those of the wealthy widow Khadija. She recognized something special in Muhammad and soon offered to be his wife. He agreed even though she was 15 years older. She was independently wealthy. She was a businesswoman. Um, she exerted her autonomy in the relationship by being the one to ask. Muhammad and Khadija were blessed with six children, but only four girls are believed to have survived childhood. In this, their lives were not unlike any other Arab family of the 7th century. At the age of 30, Muhammad began to seek solitude in the hills around Mecca. In his 40th year, while meditating in a cave, he experienced visions, strong inward signs like the breaking of the light of dawn. These visions continued for three nights. Then, the angel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad and commanded him, Proclaim in the name of thy Lord and cherisher, who created man out of a clot of congealed blood. Proclaim, and thy Lord is most bountiful. So began the revelations that would consume Muhammad for the next 23 years. But at first, he did not understand what was happening to him. You're an ordinary man. You do ordinary things. So when this thing happens to you, you're going to say, no way. No way this is happening to me. Something must be wrong here. So the fact that he was surprised, overwhelmed, nervous, I mean, he came back trembling, you know, I said, that makes absolute sense. He consulted both his wife, whom he respected hugely, and he also consulted a relative of hers, and both these people confirmed to him that indeed the manner of revelation was such that it, it was genuine rather than false. Because Muhammad was most likely illiterate, it is believed others helped in recording his revelations. The Quran was revealed orally to the Prophet Muhammad via the Archangel Gabriel, who was transmitting the word of God. Then the Prophet repeated orally the revelation to his companions, and that revelation was then recorded. And that's how the Qur'an became written, directly from what the Prophet had stated. The revelation of the Qur'an is the central miracle of Islam. The word itself means recitation. It is meant to be read aloud. As scripture, the Qur'an is unique. It isn't compiled thematically, nor is it narrative in style. Instead, it is Arabic poetry of a high order. Stories and admonitions, advice and warnings, all mixed together to reflect and reveal God's will. In these revelations, Muhammad was directed to revive, indeed reinvent, the monotheist religion of Abraham, creating the tenets of Islam belief in a single God, prayer, charity, fasting, and pilgrimage. These became what are known today as the five pillars of Islam. The first pillar is the simple declaration of faith known as the Shahada. I testify that there is no God other than God, and I testify that Muhammad is his messenger. These simple words lie at the heart of Islam. They are whispered into the ear of every newborn Muslim child and linger on the lips of the dying. They have been the subject of Islamic poets and calligraphers down through the ages. To convert to Islam, one must only say the Shahara once with sincerity. So that's the first pillar, simply the utterance of that testament of faith. The second pillar is praying five times a day. Called the Salah, these ritual prayers are said while facing the city of Mecca. 
They are observed at five specific times each day, at dawn, midday, in the afternoon, at sunset, and in the evening before going to sleep. It acts as a constant reminder, a constant engagement with the divine. For me, prayer is an act of checking out of my life, getting focused, and returning back to my life in a better and purer state. Cleansing, whether merely symbolic or a full ritual bath, is required to enter into a state of communion with God. The environment for prayer must be clean as well. A prayer rug keeps the faithful from contact with the unclean ground. The way that we begin our prayer is by throwing our hands up over our shoulders and saying Allahu Akbar, which is God is greater, meaning that God is more majestic and more powerful than anything that we know, and by throwing our cares away in some ways also. But no matter what country one prays in, the prayers themselves are always spoken in Arabic. Believed to be the immutable word of God as revealed to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel, they have remained unchanged since first spoken in the 7th century AD. At that time, Muhammad's revelations and their message of a single true God offended many and soon began to divide the tribe of the Quraysh. It would bring civil war to the sands of Arabia. The Prophet Muhammad succeeded in building a new community in the Arab world, a community that was not based on clan or tribe, but on faith. Within a hundred years, that community and that faith spread rapidly into an empire that dominated much of the world. It was the first triumphant age of Islam, and it would not be the last. By the year 622 A.D., Muhammad and his small community of Muslims were preaching their religion openly on the streets of Mecca. But their actions soon angered the idol worshippers and the tribal elders of the Quraysh. There were idols all around the Kaaba and in the enclosure in Mecca. And they would have uh, annual festivals also where people would come and they would have commerce there and trade and perform the pilgrimage, which is at that time connected with idol worship as well. As hosts of the Kaaba, the Quraysh were embarrassed by Muhammad's sermons against those pilgrims who brought their tribal gods to its altar. So the Quraysh began a campaign of social and economic persecution of Muhammad and his followers. The Meccans, first of all, targeted the poorer Muslims because these were the ones who belonged to uh, minor or unimportant clans. And, so, and these uh, did suffer a great deal. To make matters worse, Muhammad's uncle died, leaving him without a strong political ally in Mecca. After perhaps 10 years of preaching in Mecca, he had only a few tens of followers. And uh, towards the end of his days in Mecca, he was very much an isolated individual. Despite his troubles in Mecca, Muhammad's reputation as a fair and honest trader was known throughout the region. 260 miles to the north, the elders of the small oasis of Yathrib sent a message to Muhammad. The tribes of their city were locked in clannish disputes and blood feuds. The people of Yathrib were interested in Muhammad because they wanted basically a peacekeeper, somebody who would arbitrate between them and settle their disputes. And so, Muhammad accepted their offer and began a journey to Yathrib known as the Hijra, a journey so important it marks the year zero in the Islamic lunar calendar. Hijra gave them birth and life, resurrected them, and the Prophet moved from a hostile environment into a place where he could freely preach his message. In Yathrib, Muhammad set up the first planned community of Islam, called the Ummah, meaning community. 
he then set about making peace among the clans. So successful was Muhammad's leadership that the city soon changed its name from Yathrib to Medina, meaning City of the Prophet. But instead of peace, the Muslims of Medina soon faced open warfare. Enraged by Muslim gains, the Quraysh of Mecca responded by raising an enormous army to crush all those who worshipped Muhammad's God. The two sides faced each other at the Battle of Badr in 624. The Meccan army was more than twice as large, maybe three times as large as the Muslim force there. And even so, the Muslims completely triumphed over the Meccan army. But the conflicts continued over a period of six years. At one point, the Prophet himself was severely wounded. But finally, in 630 AD, the Muslims surrounded Mecca and forced its surrender. Muhammad at last returned to the city of his birth, heading an army of 10,000 men. Like the prophets of Judaism and Christianity before him, Muhammad's most important act was to cleanse Abraham's sacred temple of the idols that had ruled it for so long. He came up to an icon of the uh, virgin and child and he uh, covered it with his cloak and he said, wash everything else, but keep this in place. Muhammad then turned to the Meccans who had made war against him. But instead of punishing them, he offered them their freedom on the condition they cease fighting. Not only did they lay down their arms, but Muhammad's gesture inspired many Meccans to embrace Islam. The next year, 631 AD, was called the Year of the Ambassadors for the many delegations from Arab tribes who came to pay tribute to the Prophet and to convert to Islam. One year later, on June 8th, 632, Muhammad died of fever. He was 62. At that time, Muslims controlled the entire Arabian Peninsula. Within 15 years or so, the Muslims have acquired an empire. They became the superpower of the time. There was a kind of a roller coaster of conquests. Within a century, the empire of Islam encompassed an area larger than that of Rome at its peak. It was ruled by the first royal dynasty of Islam, the Umayyads. The Umayyads were a uh, family of Meccan nobles before Islam who also became Muslims and uh, became the rulers or uh, caliphs or khalifas in Arabic after 661 until 750. And they presided over the Muslim state, its largest territorial extent from Morocco and Spain in the west to China and India in the east. And with every conquest, thousands converted to the new religion, some at the edge of a sword, but the vast majority of conquered people embraced Islam slowly over generations. For several centuries after the rise of Islam, Muslims continued to rule as a minority. The order that the Muslims brought with them was one which was more favorable to the local communities, uh, so that the local communities decided that it's in their interest, actually, to live under Islam. As fellow people of the book, Jews and Christians were generally exempt from forced conversion to Islam since they too submitted to the one God of Abraham. We have reports, for example, that in the early period, in a place like Damascus, Christians and Muslims worshiped together in the same place. And everywhere they went, the Muslims established a civilization built upon the values of the Quran, as exemplified by the five pillars of Islam, the sacred duties of every Muslim. After the devotional prayers of the Shahada and the Salah, the third pillar of Islam is the alms tax, or zakat. Charity is heavily emphasized in the Quran. If you compare what the Quran says in terms of regulating, let's say, the modesty of women to what the Quran says about charity, there's no comparison. The charity is emphasized 10 times more. The zakat is required of all Muslims with the ability to contribute. 
So uh, everything that you own, you take 2.5% and you give it. You pay it directly to the poor. Today, local mosques or Muslim community organizations usually collect the zakat. But unlike tithing in a church, the zakat cannot be used to pay for the operation of a mosque. Instead, it must be entirely distributed to those in need. The fourth pillar of Islam is the sacramental fasting of the holy month of Ramadan. Ramadan is a month in the Islamic calendar, and it's the month that Muslims believe the Quran was revealed to Muhammad. So it's a very holy month for Muslims. Now the fast means from the first twilight in the morning, about an hour and a half to two hours before sunrise, to sunset you don't drink or eat or have any sexual activity. Exceptions are made for the sick and injured, young children, the elderly, and expectant mothers. Like the fast of Christian Lent, this celebration of gracious cleansing is meant to foster inner reflection on the gifts of life and the needs of those less fortunate. It's really one month in a year where you're supposed to, to, to advance your efforts, to intensify your efforts to build this relationship with God. Many Islamic scholars believe that the concept of Ramadan evolved from an older Hebrew tradition. The notion of fasting is the same. And the notion of fasting is, it seems to me, in both traditions, if you want to develop and cultivate in people a sense of compassion for the poor, you can't do it just by preaching. You've got to feel it in your stomach. It's got to be hunger. While fasting is a holy abjuration, feasting is a sacred indulgence. Islam has four holy festivals during the year, called Ides. The festival that comes at the end of Ramadan is the great Eid of the breaking of the fast. Another holy festival celebrated only by the Shia falls during the month of Muharram in the Islamic lunar calendar. It commemorates the death of Hossein, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. Hossein's death in 680 AD marked the first great schism of Islam when the Shia split from the Sunni. The only difference revolves around the succession to the Prophet. Who is entitled to succeed the Prophet and lead the nation? The Sunni believe that the leader of the Muslim community should be elected while the Shia maintain that the leaders should be descended from Muhammad. The Shias believe that Ali, the son-in-law of the Prophet, should have become the first caliph or first ruler of Islam after the Prophet. As the son of Ali and one of the Prophet's daughters, Hussein was said to have been chosen by God to lead the Muslims. But the Umayyads had other ideas. He was massacred with uh, all his family members, even the infants, and all his companions. 72 people were killed. The Umayyads, who later became Sunni, continued to rule for another 70 years. But constant Shia rebellions eventually brought about their downfall. In 750 AD, the first House of Islam collapsed. But the erosion of the old empire would also give rise to a new golden age of Islam. Iraq. Today, an Islamic nation at odds with the world. Its capital city of Baghdad, the scene of night bombing attacks during the Gulf War in 1991. But it was here in the 8th century that Islam gave birth to a golden age of learning. It started with the rise of the second great dynasty of Islam, the Abbasids, a family descended from the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad, Abbas. At the center of their empire, the Abbasids built a city that became legendary for its beauty, Baghdad. Baghdad was built as a cosmopolitan city which would serve both as the capital of the empire and it was a vast empire stretching from Central Asia to, uh, to the Atlantic. But also 
this site would serve as the cultural center. The Abbasids brought to Baghdad treasures recently acquired in Islam's rapid expansion. Scrolls from the libraries of Alexandria and Pergamum and texts by the ancient Greeks, Romans and Persians, which they translated into Arabic. From the Persian side, a lot of wisdom literature and a lot of political literature, you know, the conduct of kings and so on and so forth. From the Greek side, what mostly interested them was philosophy uh, and natural science. While Christian Europe was mired in the Dark Ages, Baghdad flowered as the center of Islamic culture. Poetry and calligraphy, architecture and engineering, science and philosophy. Many disciplines flourished and some new ones were invented. At the same time that the translation started, there were actual works which were composed, original scientific works which were composed, such as, for example, uh, the famous work on algebra, the invention of the field of algebra. In this courtly climate, Arab mathematicians developed concepts of decimal fractions, exponents, calculus, and trigonometry. Even today, the number system used by the entire world is Arabic. But it was in the study and practice of medicine that Islam truly achieved distinction. While Christians in Europe were using exorcism and bloodletting to treat the sick, clean hospitals in the Muslim world were practicing advanced surgical techniques, orthopedics, and even treating mental illness. However, by the end of the 11th century, the Islamic East and Christian West were on a collision course. The actual Crusades were an attempt to colonize the Middle East by Western Europeans. It began when the Seljuk Turks took Anatolia, cutting off the overland routes used by European pilgrims to visit Christian shrines in the Holy Land. The Catholic Church was quick to respond. Pope Urban II in 1095 preached the First Crusade, and that was because uh, Jerusalem, he said, was held by the infidels. Well, Jerusalem had been held by the Muslims for hundreds of years, and there had never been that thought before. Jerusalem, city of Christ's crucifixion, and the site of the great temple of the Jews. But it is also the third holiest city in Islam after Mecca and Medina. In Islamic tradition, Muhammad, during one of his revelations, was spirited from Mecca to Jerusalem on the creature called Burak. Where the Dome of the Rock now stands, Muhammad ascended to heaven. Other than the revelation of the Quran, it is the only miracle claimed by Muhammad. He was given at that point the kind of uh, beatific vision where he saw everything that had happened in the past and everything that was going to happen in the future. And during this, he encounters Jesus and Moses, and so all of that uh, links him again to Jerusalem, to the biblical tradition. And of course, when he returned to Mecca, it was as if no time had passed. But in the year 1099, Christian crusaders finally breached the walls of Jerusalem. That night, 30,000 Muslim defenders of the city were slaughtered, causing the streets to run red with blood. For 200 years, the lands of Islam faced six major incursions by European knights. But Islam's greatest threat did not come from the Christian crusaders of the West. It came from the Mongolian horsemen of the East. In 1258, the armies of the warlord Hulagu, grandson of Genghis Khan, swept down out of the Russian steppe to plunder the city of Baghdad. The destruction was unlike anything the Muslims had ever seen before. Leaving cities like Aleppo and Damascus in flames, the Mongols marched on to the shores of Palestine, where in 1260, a Muslim army from Egypt finally stopped them. 
That was the high water mark of the Mongols as far as their advance toward the west. But their kingdom remained in Iran for some generations, and then some 40 years later, the, the Khan became a Muslim. Still, the newly converted Mongols continued their conquests, taking Islam with them into Afghanistan, China, and India. Soon, the holy city of Mecca was crowded with Mongols and Turks, Uzbeks and Afghans, Mamluks and Moors, all on the sacred pilgrimage said to have been begun by Abraham. It is the last of the five pillars of Islam, the journey to Mecca known as the Hajj. Hajj is an experience uh, which is very unique. It's a journey to God. You are journeying to God, going to his house. The trip is required of all Muslims at least once in their lifetime. That is, if they are physically and financially able to go. The Hajj for me was a big spiritual lift. I experienced something that uh, made me more aware of the serious life that I had accepted, the life to be a Muslim. Two forms of the pilgrimage exist. The Umrah is the lesser pilgrimage, taken alone or in small groups at any time of the year. The greater pilgrimage, the Hajj, always begins on the eighth day of Thilijah, the twelfth month of the Islamic lunar calendar. Nearly two million Muslims take part. For a week prior to the Hajj, pilgrims flock to Saudi Arabia eager to join in Islam's holiest rite. We go on the Hajj, we reach a certain place, the Miqat, outside of Mecca, where you have then have to put on the garb of a person who's on Hajj, which consists of two unsewn garments, and they're called the Ihram. Ihram from Haram, that which is sacred. It's the shroud that you wear when you're buried. And the symbolism is, now from this point on, you're dead to the world and you're devoting yourself to God. There's no barriers. When you're at Hajj, there's like no barriers. You can't tell the difference between who does what for a living, who's rich, who's poor, who drives a Mercedes, who drives a Toyota, whatever. That's the beautiful thing about it. Upon arrival in Mecca, a ritual cleansing called an ablution prepares the faithful for the first station along the pilgrimage path, the Kaaba. The house of God is in the middle, which is central in our life. And circumambulating around it means that God is center, the axis of our life. Said to have been built more than 4,000 years ago by Abraham himself, the Kaaba, which actually means cube in Arabic, has been rebuilt many times over the centuries. The Kaaba is always kept draped in a black cloth called the Kiswa. Replaced every year, it is embroidered by hand in gold thread with verses of the Quran. And then we march between two small mountains, Safa and Marwa, reiterating what Hagar, the wife of Abraham, did when she was searching for water for her son, Ishmael. Today, the entire length of this ancient path is protected under one roof and fully air-conditioned. This march between two mountains seven times back and forth represents our struggle in life. The next morning, Two million pilgrims descend upon the otherwise desolate plain of Arafat, seven miles outside the city of Mecca. Here, the Muslims spend the entire day and much of the next night in quiet prayer and meditation, confessing their sins to God. We stay one whole day in the desert with nothing with us. Just like the day we were born, we had nothing. We leave everything behind, men, women, 
black, white, red, all sorts of languages. Imagine two million people. On the final day of the Hajj, the pilgrims travel to the small town of Mina, outside Mecca. Here they stop to throw seven tiny stones at a granite pillar. Based on a tradition established by the Prophet Muhammad, it symbolizes the stoning of the devil and the rejection of sin. If someone performs the pilgrimage sincerely and correctly, then uh, their sins are forgiven for what they did before, and that is considered a repentance that God uh, hopefully will accept. Before departure, a last prayer service is said around the Holy Kaaba. So sacred, it is the object every Muslim must face while praying, no matter where in the world they may be. For me, I'll never forget what it was like to see the Kaaba for the first time. Um, you spend your life praying five times a day in the direction of Mecca. You spend your life envisioning it and remembering it as a place where Prophet Muhammad lived. I remember that, that I instantly started crying and that tears were streaming down my face because it was almost like returning home for me. I felt closer to God. Today, the many faces of Islam can still be seen on the Hajj in Mecca. Muslims from all over the world converge here to wash away their sins, commune with God, and find spiritual renewal. Their diversity is Islam's strength. It is precisely that strength that would give Islam another great age with the rise of the Ottoman Empire. The writings of great thinkers like Aristotle and Plato, which form the basis of modern Western culture, may not have been preserved were it not for Islamic scholars. During the Dark Ages, barbarian hordes invaded Western Europe and destroyed every Greek and Roman text they found. But Muslim scholars had translated these writings into their native tongues, thereby preserving them for future generations. Like Judaism and Christianity, Islam is a religion born in the arid lands of the Middle East. Yet, at least one Islamic society came of age in Western Europe. In the year 711, 7,000 Muslims from North Africa landed on the southern tip of the Iberian Peninsula. They named the massive rock they found there after their leader, calling it Tariq's Mountain, Jubal Tariq in Arabic, Gibraltar in Spanish. It was here in Spain that Islam gave shape to a truly remarkable civilization. A civilization is judged by its libraries, by its public baths, by its open debate, uh, by the interaction of cultures and freedom and tolerance. And here we had exactly these things a thousand years ago in Spain. Muslim Spain uh, or Al-Andalus uh, was a truly multicultural society in every sense of the word. It had uh, Christians and Jews and, and Muslims, significant communities of all three religions. In this region, today known as Andalusia, Muslim architects built the captivating terracotta courtyards and the breathtaking mosques of Cordoba and Seville. The West would call the Muslims who settled here the Moors, and they would bring Islam to a new cultural zenith in Spain. Horticulture, navigation, uh, astronomy, medicine, chemistry, mathematics, uh, a great deal of that really came to us uh, through Spain into Europe from the Islamic civilization. At the Moorish-sponsored school of Toledo, Muslim, Jewish, and Christian scholars working together translated the ancient texts collected by earlier Muslim dynasties into Latin, a language all of Europe could understand. Then later, of course, those ideas were transmitted into Western Europe and had a good deal to do with the Western European Renaissance. But this rarefied atmosphere of religious tolerance and scholarly collaboration did not last. 
In the 13th century, Catholic forces began the Reconquista, the Christian reconquest of Spain. By the late 1400s, only the enclave of Granada remained under Muslim rule. But by 1492, it too fell to the Christians, bringing an end to more than seven centuries of Islamic rule. But elsewhere in the world, Islam was on the rise. By the end of the 15th century, throughout the Muslim world, you had a series of great and very successful military states, the great sultanates. In West Africa, you had the great Sangai Empire, you had the Safavid Empire in Iran, and in India, you had the first real political military unification of India under, again, an Islamic sultanate. On the Indian subcontinent, the Mughals, a Muslim dynasty descended from Genghis Khan, ruled over an empire so large, it comprised nearly one-fifth of the world's population. Here, an Islamic culture of learning and enlightenment once again blossomed. It was a time when India, in a sense, reached a new peak of glory. You had an incredible uh, flourishing of art, of architecture, of literature, uh, of prosperity. And it culminated in the period of Shah Jahan, who created the Taj Mahal, one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. But it was the rise of another Islamic sultanate that would prove a direct threat to the West. In 1453, Constantinople, the capital of the Christian Byzantine Empire, fell to Muslim troops. After more than a thousand years of Christian rule, the Turkish Ottomans transformed the ancient Greek city into the capital of their ever-expanding Islamic empire. They renamed it Istanbul, meaning Islam in abundance. At the top of the Ottoman bureaucratic pyramid was the Sultan, an Arabic title meaning ruler. Sultans were military commanders whose mission was to protect Islamic society. The Sultans lived in the opulent palace of Tapkapi, designed to reflect the grandeur of the Ottoman court. Also housed here, in luxurious quarters of carved wood and glazed tile, were the women of the Sultan's extended family, the harem. The term comes from the Arabic word haram, meaning forbidden. The Orientalist school of European artists depicted them as dens of sin and opium, even though most of these writers and painters had never even been to the Middle East, let alone seen an Ottoman harem. The image usually coming out of these accounts is that the, the harem in general is a, is a secluded place, is a dangerous place uh, to enter. It would seem that uh, these accounts reflect more the fantasies of the people who wrote them. In fact, the harem was the nerve center of the royal household. Among the wives and concubines housed within were the mothers of future sultans. Thus, the harem commanded significant political power. Uh, these were not isolated people, they were not lazy, they were not invisible, they were engaged in the economic life, invested in long-term trade as well as internal trade. They built endowments, charitable endowments, soup kitchens, uh, mosques, uh, schools and, and the like. But the harem also underscores a significant difference between Islam and the Judeo-Christian tradition. According to the Holy Quran, Muslim men are permitted to marry more than one wife. Marry women of your choice, two or three or four. Even so, permission is only granted on the condition that all wives are treated fairly and equally, so that there is no favoritism. But if ye fear that ye shall not be able to deal justly with them, then only one. That will be more suitable to prevent you from doing injustice. 
And yet, many Muslim men historically have interpreted it almost as an injunction to go out and marry more than one. The West has long found much to criticize about the status of women in Islamic societies. Although laws vary from country to country, within the pages of the Quran at least, a woman's rights are clearly defined. The Quran intended to eradicate many negative practices and attitudes towards women and did so in explicit terms. The Quran actually granted women the right to own property, to receive an inheritance, and to have a choice in their own marriage and divorce. The Quran also granted women the right to vote 1,300 years before Western societies even considered it. I think it's very interesting that a lot of feminists overlook the fact that, um, you know, in this country in particular, women only got the right to vote in the last 100 years. Still, in some areas of the Islamic world, many women live harshly restricted lives. To the average Westerner, the traditional head covering worn by Muslim women, the hijab, has become a symbol of oppression. I remember particularly um, walking down the street and a woman was, was looking very intently at me, staring very intently. And she came up and she walked directly up to me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, honey, you're in America now, you don't have to wear that here. To me, the hijab is just 45 inches of material. It's ironic that it has become such a pivotal issue of concern, both within the Muslim community and for non-Muslims. The covering of one's head is an aspect of several major religions. Today, many Christians and Jews continue to honor this ancient symbol of humility before God. Likewise, some Muslim women choose to wear the hijab only during prayer and other religious occasions. I don't wear the hijab. I decided not to wear it. I think modesty is something that comes from the inside out. It's not just about one scarf, one piece of cloth. Uh, that doesn't make you a good Muslim. To read it literally, the Quran requires modesty of both women and men. But the specific choice of covering, from the total concealment of the Afghan burqa to the slightly more revealing shador of Iran, reflect cultural preferences, not the edicts of Allah. Islam was never meant to be a religion that oppresses women. It's just turned out that way because of the way it's manipulated by people who are really expressing their own culture that's patriarchal and tribal and is a reflection of what the society was like before Islam came to the world. Yet, by the end of the 18th century, no veil could protect Islam from the intrusion of the West. In the 16th century, under Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, the Ottoman armies became a threat to Western Europe when they conquered the Balkans and much of the Crimea. The Ottomans laid siege to Vienna, capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in 1529, and again in 1683. But this was the farthest into Europe that the Islamic Empire would ever reach. By the 18th century, the Ottomans could no longer keep pace with the emerging Western European powers. The question of why that change took place is one that is embedded, I think, in the broader developments of world history that the real difference in the 18th century is the coming of the Industrial Revolution. The Ottomans' once brilliant bureaucracy became bloated and corrupt. Their powerful sultans reduced to political weaklings. The great Ottoman Empire was beginning to crumble. In the early summer of 1798, a fearless young French general named Napoleon Bonaparte and his invasion force stepped ashore at Alexandria on the Mediterranean coast of Egypt. 
A few weeks later, in the Battle of the Pyramids, Napoleon easily defeated a larger Egyptian army and captured the city of Cairo. Over the next century, France and England took advantage of weakening governments throughout the Middle East. Various areas were taken at different times, but on the whole, each conquest shared some characteristics with all the other ones, and that was that the uh, Europeans had a definite idea of ethnic superiority which made an absolute line between them and the conquered people. And that line was all the more clear with the Muslims because the Muslims were different in religion as well. European pathways to power followed different routes. European financiers provided funds to Egypt for the construction of the Suez Canal, which began in 1859. However, the massive debts incurred by Egypt in its struggle for modernization ultimately led to Britain taking over the canal and the country. By 1882, the British simply occupied Egypt and made sure that nothing that would undermine British security or British access through the Suez Canal. Meanwhile, France concentrated on Algeria, intent on making it the breadbasket of Europe. The lands of the people were all confiscated. The Arabic language and the religion of Islam were discouraged by the French. So that was a more vicious type of colonialism. But it was World War I that caused many Islamic nations to come under direct foreign rule. In 1914, the crumbling Ottoman Empire allied itself with the central powers of Germany, Austria, and Hungary. Upon their defeat in 1918, the remaining Ottoman territories became spoils of war, to be divided up among the winners. Britain obtained control of Egypt, Palestine, and Arabia. France took Lebanon, Syria, Morocco, and Tunisia, in addition to its already established colony of Algeria. What this does is that effectively it deconstructs and dismantles the system of authority that Islam had developed over, uh, you know, 1,200 years. Under the colonial yoke, unrest was brewing, fueled by disgruntled Muslim writers and scholars. Ultimately, their goal would be to drive out the West and to establish their own governments based on traditional Islamic principles. One of the most effective of these opposition groups was the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is an organization which was founded in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna in Egypt, which originally was uh, meant to regenerate Islam in that country but later on, it became a significant and revolutionary political movement. The Muslim Brotherhood was an important part of the revolutionary efforts that ultimately led to Britain's withdrawal from Egypt in the 1950s. Elsewhere, after World War II, other colonies found their own routes to independence. Some peaceful, others bloody. Yet some of these fledgling nations didn't return to traditional Islamic ideals. Instead, many new states fell under power-hungry secular and authoritarian governments, often corrupt reflections of the Western colonialism from which they won their freedom. Most people in the West forget that one of the most important heritages of imperialism throughout the world, and in particular in the Middle East, is that imperialism brought to the Middle East real ideas and skills in having central authoritarian governments. The groups resisting these new forms of rule became known as Islamists, whose message is reflected in the words of Said Qutb, leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. 
it is necessary to revive that Muslim community, which is buried under the debris of the man-made traditions of several generations, and which is crushed under the weight of those false laws and customs, which are not even remotely related to the Islamic teachings. While modern Islam was struggling to redefine itself, its diverse societies were evolving into different forms, from the progressive to the puritanical. One particularly influential and puritanical Islamic movement has become well known to the West in recent years, Wahhabism, which has its roots in the 18th century. In the middle of the Arabian Peninsula in the 18th century, there was a very strict teacher that emerged. His name was Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab achieved a fanatical following among the Bedouin tribes of Arabia by preaching an ascetic puritanical form of Islam. His followers, the Wahhabis, first gained political power when they forged an alliance with the House of Saud, an ancient royal Arabian bloodline. You had a tribal chieftain, Muhammad ibn Saud, and a puritanical teacher, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, creating then a system which is the foundation for the Saudi state that was created in the 18th century. These Saudi leaders became the royalty of modern-day Saudi Arabia. And so that the foundation of the Saudi state then today is this combination of a desert warrior spirit with a mission of puritanical Islamic reform. Thanks to the abundant fossil fuels welling up from their ancestral homelands, the Saudi royal family commanded a new source of wealth, oil. With these riches came power, and Wahhabism grew in influence throughout other parts of the Middle East. Petrodollars earned from Middle Eastern oil enriched the Saudi royals. In keeping with charity, the third pillar of Islam, the royals help fund social programs, build hospitals, schools, and mosques. But some extremists have taken that wealth and put it to violent ends, attacking Western interests under the banner of jihad. Jihad. It is a concept so integral to Islam Many Muslims believe it constitutes a sixth pillar of the faith. But many Muslim scholars and practitioners decry the simplistic warlike interpretation of the term. The Arabic to English translation of jihad is struggle, um, and a sacred struggle or a holy struggle, but it is first and foremost an inner struggle. Growing up in America as a Muslim, I had friends who were dating, I had friends who were drinking, um, doing all kinds of things that weren't permissible in Islam. And for me, that was my jihad, that was my struggle to deal with those temptations and overcome them and say, you know, this is something that my religion doesn't allow. The greater jihad is to, the, the, to struggle against your base desires. The, the lesser jihad is to struggle against an enemy. It is a radical interpretation of this lesser definition of jihad with which most of the world is now too tragically familiar. Over Muslim history, the term jihad has more often meant uh, just war. So it is a kind of just warfare. And that, in the modern sense, is very often determined to be defensive war against external aggressors. Even so, the Quran places restrictions on those who would wage this type of warfare. Fight in the cause of Allah, those who fight you. But do not transgress limits, for Allah loveth not transgressors. In Muslim warfare, 
It's uh, prohibited to kill women and children, to kill non-combatant civilians, for example. These things are all completely prohibited. Yet recent events have shown that for many thousands of Muslims, the end justifies the means in their definition of holy war. The events of September 11, 2001, left an entire world speechless with horror. Long before any news report had identified the perpetrators of this heinous deed, many Americans already assumed it was the work of extremist Islamic terrorists. How did a religion that preaches peace and tolerance become so entwined with violence in Western thinking? America's first public encounter with Islam began with the confrontational rhetoric of the black Muslim movement, the Nation of Islam. We're not American. We are people who formerly were Africans who were kidnapped and brought to America. Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. Islam had arrived in America long before the racial turmoil of the 1950s and 60s. Millions of black slaves forcibly shipped to North America in the 18th and 19th centuries came from the largely Islamic nations of West Africa. Once they reached America's shores, they were stripped of their identities, heritage, and even their religion. I have to accept that we were completely cut off from our cult, past culture, and that includes Islam. In 1930, Wali Farad, also known as Wallace Fard, created his own form of Islam in the poorer neighborhoods of Detroit. He claimed to be a prophet sent to help black Americans rediscover their heritage as both Africans and Muslims, and thus founded the Nation of Islam. Uh, they were the discontents, and Farah knew that. He knew that if he could reach them with his message, many of them would accept it for a new mind and a new way of perceiving themselves and the real world. Elijah Poole, the son of a Baptist minister, was one of Fard's earliest acolytes. When he came to Detroit, uh, within a few years, a uh, hard time during the Depression, he met uh, Mr. Farah. He made such an impression on my father that he had my father as a willing and obedient servant till death. Poole changed his name to Elijah Muhammad and became the chief minister of the Nation of Islam. In 1934, he took over the organization and over the next three decades, gradually transformed it into a powerful political force. Yes, sir. But I represent to you God in person. Yes. One new member was Malcolm Little, whose part Egyptian mother had exposed him to Orthodox Islam in childhood. While an inmate at Norfolk State Prison in Massachusetts, Little became aware of Elijah Muhammad's movement. He was doing, I think, 11 or 14 year sentence when he heard my father. After joining the Nation of Islam in 1948, Malcolm Little adopted the last name of X as a rejection of what he termed his slave name. No, what was your name? And why don't you now know what your name was then? Where did it go? Where did you lose it? Who took it? And how did he take it? After his release from prison in 1952, Malcolm X became the national spokesperson for the Nation of Islam, increasing membership and spreading Elijah Muhammad's word. But the ideology of the Nation of Islam cast the white man as the devil, a view not shared by Orthodox Islam or even Malcolm X. Wrestling with his private beliefs and public role, Malcolm X was seen as a threat to the organization. In 1964, he was expelled. Not long after, he set off on what became his pivotal pilgrimage to Mecca. It was on the pilgrimage to, to Mecca 
that his eyes were really open. He looked around and he said, my goodness, you know, there are people with blonde hair and blue eyes and people with very dark skin. And, and he saw that Islam was a religion of people of all races and all nationalities. And that really sort of gave the lie to some of what he was being taught by Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X returned from Mecca, preaching an enlightened view of Islam, what many today call traditional or global Islam. His charisma and his power as a personality was so great that all eyes were on him and he came to the truth of the separation between the nation of Islam and global Islam. And he did it in the public, he did it on stage, he did it on camera. But this philosophical stance displeased more conservative members of the nation of Islam. In 1965, as he spoke before a meeting of the Organization for Afro-American Unity, Malcolm X was gunned down by a group who many believe were conspirators from within the nation of Islam. Despite his death, however, Malcolm X's vision of Islam would continue to steer the movement. When Elijah Muhammad passed away in 1975, his son assumed a new leadership role. When the son, Wallace Dean Muhammad, took over the organization, he had already made that transition with Malcolm. And I told them, we are Muslims now, we are following the Quran, we should identify more clearly with Muslims all over the world. In 1976, W. Dean Muhammad changed the name of his father's movement to the World Community of Al-Islam in the West. And today, most African-American Muslims worship side by side with Muslims of all races and colors from every corner of the world. Some, however, rejected this reform and became followers of Louis Farrakhan's splinter group, which he also named Nation of Islam. But Americans were soon to be faced with more images of Muslims at odds with the West. This time, the flashpoint was Israel. From its birth in 1948, Israel has been the focus of a bitter territorial dispute. Many of its early opponents were not Muslims, but Palestinian Christians. In recent years, however, the conflict has taken on the qualities of a holy war. 1967. In the Six-Day War, Israel successfully crushed the military forces of the threatening Arab states. The victory would only escalate the tensions in the Middle East. Twelve years later, Americans would awaken to the fact that they too were targets of rage. This time, from fundamentalist Muslims. In the wake of a popular rebellion against the U.S.-backed Shah of Iran, the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, a highly respected Shia cleric, returned from exile in France to establish a new Islamic government. The uh, Ayatollah's revolution, which symbolized the response of ordinary Iranians, was also a response to modernity itself. How far would the modern age impinge on and change traditional life in Iran? A lot of people felt there were too many changes taking place and too fast. Because it was seen as an ardent supporter of modernity at the expense of Islamic values, the U.S. was cast as the great Satan. In 1979, Iranian revolutionaries seized the American embassy in Tehran holding its diplomatic personnel hostage for 444 days. The Ayatollah Khomeini was now transformed from an Ayatollah talking of religion and uh, theological matters into a practical ruler. Now the big question of course is how a cleric transfers or transforms from a man of scholarship into a man of administration and sometimes that transformation is not a very successful one. In 1981, the forces of Islam turned against one of their own. Many Muslims were enraged that Egypt's president, Anwar Sadat, had signed a U.S.-brokered peace treaty with Israel. But the soldiers who participated in Sadat's assassination 
were Islamic extremists intent on establishing a fundamentalist Islamic state in Egypt. There was real concern for the first year or two that there would be a major Islamic revolution in Egypt. That didn't happen. The average Egyptian was not inspired by the Iranian revolution to move in that direction. In 1990 and 91, America became directly involved in the Middle East conflict, leading an international coalition against Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait in the Gulf War. Hussein's aggressive campaigns, however, had no connection with Islam. Saddam Hussein is far from an Islamic figure. He is a military dictator, he's a tyrant, he tortures, he, his citizens disappear. Uh, he's gassed uh, and killed uh, the Kurds up in the north, he's killed and bombarded the Shias in the south. Uh, but remember that he has a certain symbolic significance for the Arab world. Because people are giving a choice to themselves. Do we support a Muslim ruler, however bad? Or do we support America? which is attacking a Muslim ruler. In more than 50 years of Arab-Israeli conflict, the world has witnessed a multitude of atrocities committed in the name of Islam. Assassinations, hijackings, and more recently, suicide bombings. Now, of course, um, suicide in Islam is categorically forbidden to a Muslim. Uh, in theory, God gives life, only God can take life. Today, radical factions of Islam have honed in on the United States as a target of terrorism, culminating in the attacks of September 11, 2001. September 11 made Americans aware of the viciousness of the radical, violent fringe in Islam. But it also, paradoxically, made more Americans aware of the fact that there are Muslims who are their neighbors who care in the same way that they do. Muslims of the world are at a crossroads. How will they define their faith in the modern world? For all Muslims, it is said every new day is a challenge to live an exemplary life. For at the end of time, everyone must answer to God on the Day of Judgment. In fact, all Islamic teachings can be reduced to God, revelation, and judgment. And the idea of judgment is the motor vehicle which drives the uh, Muslim life along because the purpose of life is not just this life of the world but is to uh, attain peace in the afterlife. For those who do not walk the straight path to God, the depths of perdition have many layers. Hellfire is the place of punishment for the people who commit evil here and who do not repent. and. Um, there are various uh, degrees, and that is not dissimilar, really, from medieval Christian teaching on this point. For those who submit to the will of God and seek repentance for their sins, a great reward awaits. Paradise would be a place where there would be no suffering, and that there's the reward of those who do good in the test of this life. But when Judgment Day arrives, Muslims believe they will not look on the face of God because God has no form that humans can possibly comprehend. Allah is he who raised the heavens without any pillars, and it is he who spread out the earth and set thereon mountains standing firm and flowing rivers and fruit of every kind. Behold verily in these things, there are signs for those who understand. But until the Day of Judgment, Muslims must live in the physical world with all its troubles, influences, and challenges. That, some Muslims feel, is becoming increasingly difficult. 
and some are responding with violence. Here we have a hijacker committing suicide, violating the Quran, taking the lives of people, violating the Quran twice over. And we have to ask ourselves, what is going on in the Muslim world? And what is going on in the Muslim world is a lot of confusion, a lot of anger, a sense of injustice. So you have a paradoxical situation emerging in the minds of these uh, young men that they can violate the Quran itself by committing suicide and killing innocent people because the situation demands it. So we are seeing a desperate time in the Muslim world. Hijackers, hostage takers, suicide bombers. These are the images many associate with Islam. But do these extremists represent the religion's true message? Even though people know that there are a lot of things that Christians have done, uh, they tend to talk about the teachings of Jesus as though that somehow represents Christianity, uh, not what Christians have actually done. And then they look at Islam and don't know what the Quran says or what Muhammad taught uh, through his sayings and actions, but see the behavior of extremists and think that represents Islam. It is understandable to fear those terrorists who claim to act in the name of Islam. However, nerve gas attacks in the Tokyo subway, IRA bombings in Britain, the carnage in Oklahoma City, these and other recent events show us that Islam holds no monopoly on terror. After the Oklahoma City bombing, we did get a letter in the mail uh, with a clipping about the bombing. And somebody had put a post-it note on it saying, look what your people have done. In the end, it turned out that a white American man was responsible, Tim McVeigh. And so I guess they were right. It was one of my people who did it because I'm American too. Islam is a dynamic religion that thrives in some of the most modern places on earth and struggles in many of the most troubled. I feel that the saddest thing that has happened to Islam in the contemporary age is the Arab-Israeli conflict. Why? Because it has become, among so many people, impossible to attempt to talk about Islam, think about Islam, uh, engage Islam without immediately thinking about this one bloody conflict that won't go away. There's going to be a peace sooner or later, either by exhaustion or by attrition or by imposition. There'll be a peace. Now, there is the, the religious communities have to prepare the heart right now so that the wounds can be healed, so that people can talk together. Though the Islamic world has freed itself from colonial rulers, thus far, few stable and fair governments have emerged to replace them. Islamic societies, once cultural, scientific, and political world pioneers, are suffering crises of leadership, both political and intellectual. We are seeing a time when Muslim scholars, Muslim leaders, really need to be able to understand the Quran, their own tradition, and then relate it to the world and to the wider world events that are taking place within the context of trying to understand and uh, be able to live with other cultures. Because if that doesn't happen, the 21st century will be a very turbulent and a very difficult century for everyone concerned. These different Muslim groups, the African-Americans, the Pakistanis, the Egyptians, the Palestinians in America, all of us should be seeking opportunity to come together and um, have discussion of what Islam is for us in any part of the world and what Islam is for us in this democracy. Iraq is my birthplace. The government of Iraq took half of my family hostages and killed many of them. America gave me freedom and dignity. This is the land where I can worship God freely without fear, without intimidation, without the harassment of the secret uh, intelligence. And I love this country. And I am thankful to God who brought me here to this country and made me feel again that I'm a human. This is a time when 
uh, religion has to show its real, real soul. If we don't, I think it will be a confirmation that religion is passé, more than that, that it's a negation of all of the healthy dreams that all of us have for the future. The biblical imperatives are pretty clear. The two greatest commandments are to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the question becomes immediately, well, who is my neighbor? Well, surely Jesus wasn't saying only people who look like you and think like you and who worship exactly like you, but it, it's, it's clearly a reference to other human beings. It is in everybody's interest that our worlds do not collide, but rather reinforce each other because we all are hoping for the same thing. We all, be all believe basically in the same things. And when we think we don't, it's only because we have looked at each other as stereotypes, not as human beings. To many in the West, Islam remains a paradox, a religion that professes peace yet is used to justify violence, a culture that promotes science and technology yet seems to resist modernization. Like Judaism, Christianity, and all the world's great faiths, Islam has many dimensions and has been interpreted in many different ways. And like other religions, it can turn violent, especially when defending its beliefs against what it sees as evildoers. Some are hopeful that Muslims, Christians, and Jews will be able to reestablish a peaceful coexistence. But others aren't so sure. As violence continues, suicide bombers get younger, and death tolls go on rising. Many Muslims themselves believe that if Islam is to continue to grow as a religion of the future, it will only be, inshallah, if God wills it so. For the History Channel, I'm Arthur Kent. Thanks for joining us. Our historic retrospective on the 9-11 year now continues with a report we first broadcast just days after the terrorist attacks on America. The History Channel's Josh Binswanger and guests discuss the origins of radical Islamic movements. That's coming up next. Please stay with us.